Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch, a prison for your mind. If you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. What happened at the cross? You see, like the Matrix, people born into this world are born into a prison. A prison th that they can't taste, like Morpheus says, like you, you can't smell it, you can't feel it. It's the world that's what he described as being pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. You see, in the movie The Matrix, people lived in this virtual reality system. They were plugged into a, a, a computer, basically, but they didn't know it, but they were in prison. And so, um, likewise, in this world, you are born into a prison. Uh, why did Jesus die on the cross? He came to free us from this, what the Bible calls this present evil age that we're born into. Uh, we're born into it because of what Adam did in the Garden of Eden when he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the, t the tree that uh, God told him not to eat of. Adam and Eve ate of that tree. They fell for the deceiver, the slaver's lie. And because of that, we were born into a prison. We were born POWs. We were born slaves. In that second clip, it showed uh, uh, Liam Neeson in the movie Taken, and his daughter was abducted into this uh, slave, in this human trafficking ring, and she was a slave, and he said he was going to come after her like, like any father would. And in the movie, this wasn't part of the, this clip, but he said, I have a certain set of skills. <coughs> you see. And um, so Adam and Eve fell for the lies of the enemy and put us into prison. So the cross is not uh, about some strange need for blood, that, that God had to be appeased by, by blood. And then when, when, when you're born, he looks at you as like, oh, you're so, y'all are so bad and evil, I can't stand to look at you. That's not how God sees you. God loves you when you're born. He loves you when you're a toddler. He loves you when you're young. He loves you when you're old. The cross is about freeing us from prison. See, it's, it's called the dominion of darkness in another place. I talked about the, the present evil age. Colossians says he, uh, Jesus delivered us on the cross. He delivered us from the power 
of darkness, the authority of darkness, the dominion of darkness, Jesus delivered us, de delivered us from the dominion of darkness. But before Jesus, we are in a prison, and the devil's job is to blind us from the truth. He is called in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, as the God of this world. And he blinds the minds of those that believe not. See, because people are in prison even though they don't know it. People go and they have workout uh, groups. They go and they work out together. And folks go to the club together. You know. We used to be that way. Everybody was in the same boat. Everybody was in prison until they received the gospel. You have people, they think they're free, but they're not free. It's the, it's the restricted liberty of a slave. See, you can be in prison and get privileges to spend more time out in the yard, but you're still a prisoner. <laughs> you may be able to spend, they may give you the liberty because of good behavior. See, some people say, well, you know, I'm good. I don't hurt anybody. I, I, I give to the United Way and I give to charities. I don't harm anybody. I mind my own business. I help people in need and, and I'm good. It's not about doing good and avoiding evil. It's not about that. It's about Living the God kind of life. Without God, you're in this prison and you are in uh, an inferior reality. It's called the dominion of darkness. I don't care how, how, how much time you and your group go on, they go on a vacation together and travel the world. or Y'all get together and y'all go clubbing and you say you're having a good time. But again, it's the restricted liberty of a slave. You, you, you really bound by a chain and the devil gives you enough rope to make you think that you're having fun, to make you think you're free, but you're not free. It's the world that's pulled over your eyes. So it's not about doing good and avoiding evil. That's what religion tries to, uh, to, to make us think that you just do good and avoid evil. No, it's not about that. It's about living life with God, discovering who God created you to be, and living not the American dream, but the heavenly dream. The Bible says that your days were fashioned for you before you had days. That, see, God created you with a purpose in mind. He did, you weren't born and then all of a sudden God figures out what he wants to do with your life. No, before you were formed in the, in the womb, he knew you. It's interesting. I don't really have time to go into this. I haven't studied this out, but the Lord showed me a parallel in, in what happened in the Garden of Eden. You ever wonder why? that the tree that God told Adam not to eat of, Adam and Eve, he told them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You ever notice, or you, did you ever, do you ever wonder why it's not called the tree of the knowledge of evil? Why is it good and evil? God didn't want them to eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What I believe, and I, I still need to study this out because it's really fascinating to me. See, people today are living off the wrong tree, trying to do good and avoid evil because when Adam and Eve ate of that tree, they knew right from wrong, but then trying to do good and not do bad is living by self-effort. Had they not ate of that tree, see, the tree of life was available to them, and by eating of the, partaking of the tree of life, all they would have known is the life, the dream that God had for them. God would have led them to only good. And that's a parallel of where we are today. People are living according to the law, religious folks, and they preach the law. But we're not under the law, we're under grace. And in that deep hour of the fall, God confronted the slaver. 
It's like he was saying, I've got a particular set of skills. <laughs> and he announced that he was coming, that, 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 he, that somebody was coming, which was Jesus, that was going to crush. He confronted the devil. He's going to crush your head. So, so the cross is not about satisfying some bizarre need for blood. No. The cross is about divine retribution from everything that harms God's people. It's about God applying the hammer of justice, hard justice, to the head of the slaver. God's got a particular set of skills. And he told the devil, I'm coming after you. The cross is about divine retribution against those, all the things that harm God's people. Now, that's a little bit of review, okay? And, and the, see, the cross is about God, like uh, uh, Liam Neeson, it's like God coming after us with Neeson-like vengeance, coming after his people. The cross is your way out of prison and your way into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The cross was a rescue mission. Galatians 1.3, we looked at these, but, but let me show you. See, God wouldn't say in his word that he is going to free us if we are already free. Because there are people who think they, they're free. There, there were, uh, was a religious crowd that God couldn't help. God can't help you if you think you got it. If you think you're free. He confronted these religious folks and, and he said, uh, the problem it's not that you're blind. If you, if you acknowledge you're blind, I can help you. He said, your problem is you think you see, therefore your sin remains. He was telling him, if, if you're blind, I can help you. Well, look, anyway, man, I got to finish this today. Okay, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus gave himself for our sins to what? Free us. From this, what? Evil world. I've got this highlighted in my notes. I, I, I wanted that highlighted on this. But uh, anyway, look, can, can you see this? To free us. Say free us. free us. Okay, now let's go to Colossians. I want to show you this. For he has, now the NIV says, he has what? Rescued us. See, the cross is a rescue mission. He rescued us from what? The what? The dominion of darkness. All right. Now we, we left off talking about the uh, children of Israel being delivered from Egypt. That is a type of the cross, how they went through on, uh, they went through the Red Sea and the Egyptians came after they were freed. The Egyptians decided, Pharaoh decided, and his army, they were, he was going to lead his army to come after the children of Israel. Well, the wall stood up, the water stood up uh, like a wall, and the children of Israel went through the Red Sea, and then the, is, is, the uh, Egyptians came after them, and the waters collapsed, and they drowned. Pharaoh and his slave system, all of his government, died in the bottom of that ocean, or in, in the bottom of that sea, okay? Now, that's a picture of the cross. Now, that, that's really a dramatic scene there. Uh, uh, it was dramatic what God did to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. Pharaoh and all of his army drowning in that sea, riding at the bottom of the sea. That was done as a, as a type of the cross. That is a picture of the cross. Moses, the deliverer who led the children of, of Israel, 
uh, through the Red Sea, across the Red Sea. He was a type of Jesus. Pharaoh was a type of the slaver, the devil slash sin. So Pharaoh and his army, Pharaoh representing sin, was drowned in the bottom of that sea. You know, they had no more trouble <laughs> from Pharaoh after that. Can you say amen? amen? That is a picture of the cross. See? You want a picture of the cross? See Pharaoh and his army rotting in the bottom of that sea. That's what God did to your sin. Y'all getting as quiet as you were last week. We, we showed you another picture. I, we didn't go to it in the Word, but Sodom and Gomorrah is another picture. God totally wiped those cities off of the map, off of the face of the earth. There was, there's no more trace of Sodom and Gomorrah when God got finished with it. Go try to find it. It ain't there. Those cities aren't there. That's another picture of what Jesus did for you. On the cross, what Jesus did to your sin, he removed your sin as far as the east is from the west. There is no more remembrance of our sins. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. See, God gave them, that, that's, a, that's a type of the cross, the children of Israel uh, being delivered from Egypt and Pharaoh and his army drowning in the Red Sea. It's a dramatic picture to show us what Jesus was going to do to the slaver on the cross. Romans 8 3 talks about it for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. God did. See, the law was an inferior covenant. I don't have time to go into that right now. We have a better covenant established upon better promises. What the law could, could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He, he what? He condemned sin in the flesh. The Amplified says God condemned sin in the flesh. Watch this. Subdued, overcame deprived it of its power over all who accept the sacrifice. What God did on the cross, he condemned sin in Jesus' flesh. Last week I gave you the analogy, it was like a tag team in a wrestling match that God grabbed a hold of our sin. The, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all on the cross. He took our place and as our substitute. He absorbed sin, and then, and then God comes swinging from the, from the rope into the ring and delivers the killing blow. Sin was destroyed. Hebrews 9, 6 says, He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, say now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He offered one sacrifice, in other places in Hebrew says, he offered one sacrifice for sins forever. I told you that last week, don't, don't y'all waste my time falling asleep because this is the foundation for everything. Well, Pastor, I need help with my marriage. I need help with my finances. I need, I need my, my children going nuts. I need some help. with my, Help me with my kids. I'm helping you with your kids right now. I'm telling you, you it, this, this is the foundation for everything. When you understand the cross, you're free from everything. You can rest in the loving arms of Jesus. Oh, how he loves us. When you understand his love, nothing can stop you. Because nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Ooh, I love this. He appeared one time 
See, and not like in the Old Testament where he had to go, they had to go in, the high priest had to go in year after year to offer a, a sacrifice. No. He appeared once. I could go somewhere with this, but I'm, I'm, I'm not. Let me just stick with this because I got a lot to cover. Once at the end of the ages, he appeared to what? He put away sin. Now, sin here is not a verb. It's a noun. I'm taking the English class now. Where are my teachers at? Where are my teachers at? Now, that's not good English. <laughs> I was doing pretty good. Okay. Sin here is not a verb. It is a noun. Jesus didn't do away with bad behavior. He did better than that. He did away with sin itself. He did away with the stuff on the inside of you that made you do bad. He was on the cross, made to be sin. He never committed any acts of sin, but he, was, he became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, now, now, now. Ooh, couldn't wait to tell you this. Why did God go through the trouble of the cross? Why did he... Work Jesus into the world, coming through the seed of the woman, being born of a virgin, and going to the cross. Because he could not have dealt with sin directly without killing us all. In other words, he couldn't drop an atomic bomb on the home of the devil. Had he done that, he would have vaporized all of us because we were identified with Adam because of his sin. We became identified with Adam, therefore we were identified with the devil because Adam died spiritually and he teamed up with the devil and he inherited the devil's nature. Had God just obliterated the devil, we would have went along with him. So what God did was he came undercover. I mean, this is deep undercover. He came looking like a slave, but not a slave. He, he, he came disguised in human form. Oh, glory to God. So what did he do on the cross? See, some people think Abraham Lincoln abolished slavery. No, no, he did, but that was another kind of slavery. This is the real stuff, the real slavery that, we, that the world was bound in. Jesus on the cross abolished slavery. He destroyed the matrix from within, paving the way for our liberty, our liberation, our freedom. Okay, now, anybody getting anything? Okay, what is the gospel of the cross? Let's try to bring this to a conclusion. The cross tells us two things about God. Number one, that he loves us. Two, What does the cross tell us about God? Number one, he loves us. And number two, if God is for us, nothing can be against us, not even our sin. He took care of sin. He ended it. When he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. Your sins are forgiven past, 
present, and future. He was the great high priest. In the Old Testament, when the high priest was, when, when, when the person who was doing the sacrifice brought the lamb to the high priest, the lamb had to be without blemish, without spot. The lamb had to be perfect. Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The Old Testament lamb was a type of Jesus. Let me tell you, let me tell you something about your sin. When that lamb was brought, the priest didn't examine the person bringing the sacrifice. Oh, let me see if you really, if you really repented. Let me make sure that you, you really repented of your sin. No, the high priest didn't examine the sacrificer. He examined the lamb. So when God, when you, when you commit an act of sin, your sins are already forgiven. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. What did God see when you commit an act of sin? He doesn't look at you. He looks at the lamb. And the lamb is perfect. Religion try to tell you, well, let me see if you, if you really repented. Let me see if you, you got to cry and, and snot and, 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 and beg and plead. No. You're already forgiven. The devil will always try to point you to yourself. What you got to do is turn the table on the devil and point him to Jesus. You got a problem with me? I want you to look at him. And the lamb is perfect. The good news of the cross declares that three things I want to share with you. The good news of the cross declares one, the power of sin has been completely broken. Two, the enemy has been disarmed and defeated. Three, our sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. What's the implications of this? Okay, well, what does it mean in my everyday life? All right. One, your sins are no longer being held against you. Romans 4, 8, blessed is a man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Two, you who were once condemned have been blessed with the gift of no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. As he is, so are we in this world. I like what the Good News Bible says, there is no condemnation now for those who are what? Who, 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 who what? Live in union with Christ Jesus. Three. Talk about implications now. Three, you've been forgiven once and for all time through the blood of the Lamb. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Four. In Christ, your status has changed from sinner to righteous. For, I'm telling you, that's good news, man. That's over-the-top good news. For y'all old folks like Sam Good Cook sung, sung that song. Ain't, man, ain't that news. Ain't that good news. Man, ain't that news. We played that a long time ago. Okay, look at the scripture. First. Corinthians 6.11. And certain of you were these, but you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were what? Declared righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the spirit of our God. And sin has no claim on Jesus. 
The scripture tells us that, I don't have the reference, um, the specific reference, but Jesus said something like this, the prince of the world is coming, but he has nothing in me. He has no hold on me, Jesus is saying. And see, see, sin has no claim on Jesus. And because sin has no claim on Jesus, we're identified with him because of the cross. Sin has no claim on you. So, so Pastor, that, does that mean that we, we, can, we can sin without impunity? Everybody say impunity. In other words, we, we can sin without being, we're not going to be judged. And we can just sin all we want and, 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 and without, without any judgment. Well, my question to you is, why would you want to? See, that's, that's the wrong question to ask. Why would you want to? See, in, in, in Adam, the, the sin nature that we inherited from Adam, we had no power to choose. We had to live with the consequences that, that Adam uh, put us in. But now in Jesus, who has done away with Adam's sin and your sin and my sin, now we have the power to choose. Y'all looking at me, man. Like Brother Hagin says, a, a cow at a new gate. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> sounds good anyway. See, in Adam... When, when, when we had the nature of Satan that we inherited from Adam, the sin nature, spiritual death, we had no power to choose. But in Jesus, we're now free to choose. We're out of the prison. Why would you want to go back in? That, that's, that's like somebody takes their handcuffs off of you and you playing around with their handcuffs. Putting them back on and losing the key. <laughs> Some of y'all might know what I'm talking about. If you're not old enough, maybe you watch reruns and some of these uh, back in the good old days with the shows were really clean and good, fun. Andy Griffin, some of y'all remember uh, from the Indy campus. Nita, you, you, you may remember that. Gloria knows what I'm talking about. Uh, the Fort Wayne campus, Gloria. See, uh, they had this town drunk called Otis. <laughs> and Otis sometimes would, he'd be all right. Sometimes when, when he would be, he would be okay. He would be sober or whatever. Yeah, he might have been drunk. I don't re really remember. But he didn't do nothing wrong. But he would go into the prison, into the jail to sleep. And they would just let him do it. He would just go in. He'd take the key, open up the uh, jail and go in there and just lay down. He didn't, hadn't done anything. He hadn't committed any crime. He would just go in there and sleep. Why do you want to do that, Otis? Why do you want to play around with sin when you're free? Live free. 1 Peter 2.16, New Century Version says this, Live as free people, but do not use your liberty as an excuse to do evil. Live as servants of of God. See, this is grace. When you live under grace, it's not that, oh, man, these people that uh, uh, preach grace, they just live all loose and stuff, and the people live loose. Who? Who are you talking about? See, you're not preaching grace right unless somebody asks the question, you mean we can sin all we want? That's what they did Paul. They asked him the same question. And, and, and he said, man, no, God forbid. No. Romans 6.14 says, sin shall not have dominion over you if you're not under the law, but you're under grace. Galatians 5.1, New Century Version again says, we have freedom now because 
Christ made us free. So stand strong. Do not change and go back into the slavery of the law. How? Let me wrap this up here. Praise the Lord. How do you stay free, Pastor? How, how do we live this out in a world that's bent towards sin? How practically do we live this out in our life? First of all, you've got to see yourself free. You're free in reality. He whom the Son says free is free indeed. How do I live this out? You've got to choose who you listen to. The devil will try to point you to your sin, to point you to your past. But God will have you to look at the Son. God points you to Jesus. Look at him. See Jesus. That's deep, isn't it? See him. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. See Jesus. See how he walked. See how he lived. Meditate on the word and see yourself in Christ Jesus. See yourself with the peace of God. Jesus didn't get rattled about stuff. Oh, man, I'm just worried about this. I'm worried about that. You didn't see Jesus worried about anything. Demon-possessed persons start falling out in front of him. He's asking his dad, like, okay, how long has he been like this? He wasn't all freaked out. Oh, Lord. Oh. Oh, what? Get this demon, man. Jesus was cool. Huh? Don't get freaked out over circumstances that the devil stirs up. Live free. You got the solution on the inside of you. You are in Christ Jesus. All right. In conclusion. The cross marks the end of your old life. The person you used to be died there with Jesus. That's a whole, that's a whole nother thing. Paul didn't go around always talking about what he used to do and all that kind of thing. And the Lord corrected me about that. I, I don't need to be, I talk too much sometimes about stuff I used to do. Uh, Paul talked about this stuff very little. Very little. Most of the time, he's talking about where he is now. He talked about the old man died. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith. I'm not going to focus on the dead works and the darkness, stuff I used to do, because that man, that Al is dead. People thought, well, you used to, he dead. He died with Christ. The gospel declares that you are in Christ Jesus, and you're no longer a sinful son of Adam, but you are a righteous son of God. So reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God, alive to Christ, and get on with the joyful business of living the Father's dream. That's what you're made for. I got time for this, this one scripture. Ephesians 2.10. You got that from the um, Amplified. For we are God's own handiwork. We should be. Say, I should be living the heavenly dream. I'm, I'm going out with the, uh, with the joyful business. Living out, Living out the heavenly dream. The heavenly dream. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship. One translation says his masterpiece. Recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned ahead of time for us. This is before the foundation of the world. Taking paths which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them living the Good life, which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Let's go about living.
the Father's dream for our life. Say, I'm free. I'm 